So the next speaker, Dr. Danish Bhatti, is a Assistant Professor, Department of Neurological Sciences, University of Nebraska Medical Center, Omaha, Nebraska, USA. Uh, we're going to switch to a little harder topic. Um, blepharospasm was um, relatively easier injections, you know, single muscle. There is no surprise which muscle we're injecting. We're injecting orbicularis oculi. And um, there are different paradigm, but, you know, if you're going to remember one thing, remember they all work. So, so you can't go too much wrong. Just try to be safe. Avoid the frontalis injection. And then, you know, remember there's a possibility of dry eyes with Botox injection. So tell them to your drops and watch for that if they're complaining for irritation in the eyes. Very good. So we're going to talk about cervical dystonia for botulinum toxin. And that's one of um, probably the most challenging diagnosis to inject. I will try to make it easy and simplify it for you guys. But that means that I would not be able to cover every single cervical dystonia patient that you're going to get. So we'll try to focus on the easy ones and we'll leave the hard ones for a later time. Okay? So um, let's look at that. So this is my team of movement disorders. That's my boss over there who trained me. And, um, you know, uh, and rest of our crew, we have three case managers, nurses, and two admins. We do 1,500 injections. We talked about that. Here's my uh, disclosures. I do speaking and teaching for Teva, Acadia, and Allergan, Pakistan for Botox. And we do research funding for EBV. I'm going to dedicate this lecture to the memory of my father, who passed away this year and, in and uh, encouraged me to do more education. So what we are trying to gain in the next 30 or 45 minutes that we have of cervical dystonia, I want you to remember the essential features of the subtype of cervical dystonia. No two cervical dystonia patients are same, but there are four commonalities or four patterns that we're going to look at. And then there's a mix and combination of all four. So if you have four factorial, that means there are more than 16 combinations possible of all these four or even more. But we're going to f at least understand the four basic patterns. And then you can say, well, it's a, maybe a mix of two patterns. We will explain the basics of injection planning and see how do we select based on that pattern that we realize which muscles to inject. And then we will look at the common techniques of injection. And uh, we have a patient, Dr. Nader, for cervical dystonia? OK. All right, great. No, I mean, just to be sure. All right. So let's look at a case. Here's one of my patient. Name is not correct, but Sarah. She presents with cervical dystonia. And uh, she's 60 years old, presenting with pulling and tightness in the neck. She had it for more than 10 years, but recently gotten worse. She reports difficulty keeping her head straight for the pictures and some pulling of the head to the right. Admit slight pain in the right side of the neck, and she has tried and failed cinnamate, clonazepam, and baclofen. Would you do injections on Sarah? If you would, what would you tell about benefits of shots, and what muscles would you inject, and how much? Anything? Anybody wants to jump? Or are you going to think more? And see if you can answer the same questions at the end of this talk. And see if you can tell Sarah what the benefits of her shots are going to be, and tell her or decide in your mind which muscles you're going to inject. So cervical dystonia, spasmodic torticollis. Um, it's a wrong name. Torticollis is not always present. That's, it's only one subtype of cervical dystonia. And it may or may not have any spasm with it. But it's a patterned movement. It has the same pattern. You, with time, you should be able to tell which pattern it is, because then you have to decide which muscles to inject. And it's repetitive, causes abnormal head posture. Torticollis may not be present. <laughs> most common focal dystonia. Second most common is blepharospasm that you've already reviewed. But the single most common, more common than blepharospasm is cervical dystonia. It is missed all the time. But remember these two things. Isolated head tremor is cervical dystonia, period. Almost nothing else will give you isolated uh, head tremor. Almost nothing else. There are always exceptions. And the neck pain, unexplained neck pain, especially if it's focal, if they can touch where the neck pain is, it, you have to strongly think of cervical dystonia very commonly missed. So remember this again, isolated head tremor is cervical dystonia until proven otherwise. So it's a clinical diagnosis. There is no validated diagnostic criteria. There's no validated comprehensive rating scale. And up to 88% may have a sensory trick, meaning that if you are watching them and they have uh, something wrapped around their neck, you may not see the cervical dystonia the whole visit. Or if it's a high back chair and they're resting themselves all the way back, the cervical dystonia will be gone. 
you will not be able to tell what head position. So you have to ask them to scooch forward in the chair, don't touch back, open up their dubattas, and nothing wrapping around their neck, and then try to distract them and see that dystonia show up. Very good. So botulinum toxin, Botox, for our practical purposes here, is the first line treatment of cervical dystonia as per the AAN guidelines. Actually, it's also the first line treatment for blepharospasm. So we should be thinking about reaching out for Botox more often. We, this is the recommended treatment. The chance of success of a medication for any of these dystonia is 20 to 30 percent. And even then, it's only 50 percent improvement. You can get 80 to 90 percent improvement if you plan the injections right and, and do them on the right dose. There are seven class one studies which established it as a safe and effective treatment for cervical dystonia. Level A evidence for all four toxins. There are four of them I'll show you, but we only have Botox available in Pakistan. So for all practical purposes, Botox. And um, these are the four uh, products. So it's Botox, Xeomin, Dysport, and Myoblox. So Ona botulinum toxin, Inco botulinum toxin, Ebo, and Rima botulinum toxin B. It's the only type B toxin. All of them are type A toxin but we only have Botox available in Pakistan for now. Botox is the oldest one and is still in our practice, uh, probably 70 to 80 percent of our toxin use is Botox. We have some situations where we prefer Xeomin and Myoblog, very rarely Dysport, but our go-to toxin is, is Botox, even in our practice where we have access to all four of them. So these are the vials, Botox 100 unit vial, there is also a 200 unit vial, but most commonly used is the 100 unit vial and the other three toxin. Botulinum toxins are not interchangeable. A hundred unit of Botox is not a hundred unit of anything else. The way a unit is designed is that you take a product, then you test a small sample of it on a mouse, and based on the response on the mouse, you decide what a one unit gonna be. And each batch is not the same as the last batch, but each batch is quantified on the same mouse. So that's why even if the amount is different, the biological activity will be the same. So one unit is a biological activity of a unit. So if I say I injected 20 units of Botox on a patient in blepharospasm, that doesn't mean that 20 units of myoblock will do the same. The biological activity is very different. So they're not interchangeable. And that's why I do not use all the other toxins because you have no idea what their 100 unit means. Are their 100 unit same as Botox 100 unit? Or they're equal to one unit of Botox? Are they equal to 1,000 unit of Botox? You have no idea. So that's why it's a biological activity. It's not weight, it's not volume, it's a biological activity. It's an effectiveness, the result you're getting, which is weakness. So it's a certain weakness that's happened in the mouse, which is called one unit. Very good. So successful chemo denervation in cervical dystonia and blepharospasm requires a right diagnosis. You have to analyze that abnormal movement. You don't need that in blepharospasm. You have to analyze which muscles are involved, correct dosing, correct injections, and adapting therapy to the response. You go back and then you start over if you don't get the result. So let's look at those muscles. So here's an example. So what's the correct diagnosis? Can you lower the volume? Anyone? What's the correct diagnosis on this patient? Not hearing the right answer yet. What's the correct diagnosis on this patient? It's psychogenic dystonia. A fixed dystonia is psychogenic dystonia until proven otherwise. And if I tell you the history that the patient says that when she ever has, she's, whenever she goes for surgeries and she is under anesthesia, the legs are normal. Her surgeons have told that afterwards, that my surgeons come out and they tell me that whenever you're under the anesthesia, your legs are completely normal. What's wrong with your legs? She has psychogenic dystonia. Look at Fawn's videos on psychogenic dystonia. Fixed dystonias are always psychogenic. See, so how important the correct diagnosis is? Somebody like that comes in, you're trying Botox, you're trying Botox, nothing's working. It would not work. It's a fixed dystonia. It's a psychogenic dystonia. Very good, but here's another example of cervical dystonia. And here you have to figure out what is the dystonia. What's the abnormal dystonia that you're going to inject? But look at the isolated head tremor. So, what's the position? What is the abnormal position? Which muscles are you going to inject? 
Is it entrocolis? It is postrocolis? Is it letrocolis? Right torticollis? Left torticollis? See how hard it is? So you need to know what is the primary position of that patient's abnormality before you can make the diagnosis. So which muscle are you going to inject? There are so many muscles there. There are 26 muscles that we can inject. So here are the four main groups of abnormal head movement. They can happen in any combination, but let's understand the four basic positions first. So there is entrocollis, a head down. There is postrocollis, the head up. The key here is to look at the chin. Is the chin right at the level or lower than expected or higher than expected? Otherwise, you can miss it or look from the side. There is lateral collis, which is turning of the head either one way. So look at the distance between shoulder and ear on each side. It should be the same. If one side is a little less than the other, then that's a lateral collis. And then there's a torti collis, which is twisting of the head. Look at this line, midline, passing through the nose, down in the middle of the chin. And a slight torti collis may be missed if you're not paying attention to that. But even better is to look at the ears. If the ears, if you can't see the two ears exactly the same, there may be a torticollis hiding there that you have to bring out. So here's my patient with entrocollis, very easy to miss, it looks normal. She's an old person, kind of a little stoo, looking fine. But look at her at the side and you can see that the normal horizontal plane, her head is making almost like a 45 degree angle with that normal plane. So it's an entrocollis from Parkinson's disease, the most common. So here's an examination and you will see from the front except for some mild left shoulder raising, you may miss it. But when you look from the side, you can tell, even if you look at the spine angle and the horizontal there, and here she lifts her head up to look at me because she cannot even make an eye contact with her primary position. Very good. So entrocollis is one of the easiest injections. One of the easiest injections. However, the success of treating entrocollis is not very well known. Most studies don't study entrocollis for whatever reason. That's a long debate. But the main muscle beyond gravity is sternocleidomastoid. Sternocleidomastoid. Typically, entrocollis is seen as a part of other dystonia. So there may be a torticollis with an entrocollis. Then you have to remember that to correct torticollis, you do something. But then to correct entrocollis, you have to add the SCM muscles. So sternocleidomastoid SCM muscle is the primary muscle. The starting dose is typically 10 to 40 units in the muscle given in one to three divided doses. And you can use one or two cc dilution. They recommend two cc dilution. I use one cc dilution. And they recommend an EMG needle to get the SCM. Here's injection on the right SCM on a patient with entrocollis. And I have made the SCM become more pronounced by looking to the other way and press pressing against just to show you guys the SCM. I'm using an EMG and you can hear the muscle activity which is a dystonic muscle. So wait for it. And suddenly you hear the popcorn. So you hear that. But one of the things I want to tell you here is look at my technique. I'm going up into the muscle, not straight in. Straight in, you can cross the SCM easily. It's a very thin muscle. Straight in, the risk of dysphagia is much higher because you're going in, you're squirting in. So you go into the belly, you go upwards, slanting and sloping, at least 45 degrees of a slope. And the other technique, remember, is that I'm doing it above the end of the jaw. So it's a long muscle, but the lower you do it, the higher risk of dysphagia. The higher you do it is lower risk of dysphagia. So you can use those techniques. Uh, I do go lower sometimes when needed, but just so you know. And here's the other side again, directing upwards into the belly, doing it higher above the end of the jaw and you can hear the dystonia. I'm doing both sides, by the way, because it's entrocollis and because of the tremor. Very good. Postrocollis, relatively easier, but here things start becoming more tricky. The most strongest muscle that causes postrocollis is the longissimus capitis. Very deep muscle, very midline muscle, but you can get it. But that's also the muscle whose injection most likely causes a head drop. You weaken it, you weaken it a little too much, and then from postrocollis you went to an entrocollis. So you have to be careful. The other two muscles are splenius and semispinalis capitis. I call them the splenius complex because they're right on top of each other on the lateral side of the back of the neck, away from the midline, which is the longissimus and trapezius in the midline. Lateral is splenius complex, which is splenius semispinalis. Typically, they're both involved, but typically one is involved a little more than the other. So you decide your dose a little higher on the one than the other, depends on the first one that you will hear as the needle goes in will be splenius. And if you keep going in, then you will become silent and then you will hear the semispinalis. 
Very good. So here's the posterior collis. Again, look at the chin. Look, try to look at the the head angle. And it's about 45 degrees from the horizontal. The muscle, the longissimus capitis in the midline, buried beneath the trapezius, and then splenius and semispinalis on the just lateral end of it. And sometimes one easy way to tell is to feel the edge of the trapezius, and then you will know that you're in that groove, which is the splenius and semispinalis. Here's an injection on splenius and semispinalis. The approach is lateral to the midline, and look at the direction of my needle. I am angling it towards the other ear. So you angle it towards the other ear, as the right is one of our approach to the splenius and semispinalis. And I went in deeper, and now you hear the other muscle, the semispinalis. So it was first muscle, then there was a pause, and then there was a second muscle, which was the semispinalis, and both are involved in this patient. And again, in the first poke. In splenius, some sound, but semispinalis is harder, or is more louder because more more involved. And then I'll go deeper. And now, the second one is a semispinalis. Very good. And you can do one shot or two or three shots there, all angling towards you. So, what are the doses for posterior collis? Splenius and semispinalis, five to twenty units. And you can do one or two or three sides. And longissimus, five to thirty. Thirty is a very high dose. It's a very tricky muscle to inject, and a very easy one to over-inject and cause a head drop. Uh, and you can even skip it in first injection, if uh, but use it when posterior collis is severe or you're not getting a result from splenius semispinalis, semispinalis alone. Lateral collis, so same muscle. So splenius and semispinalis also cause a lateral collis. Okay, turning to the side, levator scapulae is one of the major player here. Levator scapulae runs from the side of the neck to the same shoulder. And it pulls both of them towards each other. So typically, if you have a lateral collis and a shoulder elevation, that's levator scapulae, and that usually needs to be injected for the shoulder to relax and the head to straighten up. And then longissimus again can have slight lateral collis, but I will focus on the first and the third one. And I typically don't inject scalene. The neurovascular bundle with carotid is just behind the scalene. It's very easy to make a mistake. I do inject scalene, but I don't recommend it injecting by most other people. Okay, so here's a patient, the same patient with lateral collis, and you can see the severity. The head is touching the neck. There's actually a SUI rating scale. T is silent, T S U I, and SUI rating scale is is zero, one, two, three, and four, and it's degrees: 30, 45, 60, and more than 60. But you know, another discussion for another day. She also has entero collis. If you have missed that, remember it typically comes in combination with something else. And then again, lateral collis, you have splenius and semispinalis, you have the levator scapulae that runs right here. It's a deep muscle, it is buried under trapezius and many other muscles and could be a hard one to get to, but really rewarding. Dose is similar, 50 to 30 units in the splenius and 5 to 10 units in the levator will be a good starting combination. And then you can add scalene and longissimus if you had to. I will probably avoid longissimus just for pure lateral collis, but many times you have a lateral collis and a posterior collis, then you can inject longissimus. So remember, combinations are possible. So here's the injection technique. You can see the spasm of all these muscles. So this right here is the scalene, scalenous posterior. This is the SCM, which is also pulling it right. Here's the edge of the trapezius, and just below, and, and, and my fellow is doing the injections, uh, and that's why she's more straighter. She's not learned yet enough. And the trapezius edge is there, and just behind this trapezius that you can see standing out is the levator scapulae. And here she was going for levator, so right at that angle, and she has to go through the trapezius to reach the levator. And that's the approach for levator, more flatter and straighter back right at the interior edge of the trapezius and you go deep until you hear the levator. Okay, so torticollis, the actual one, the bad one, which is almost always present in combination, uh, you have twisting from two main groups. Now this is important, remember it. There is the anterior twisters, which is the SCM. So it twists it the opposite way. Right? Right SEM, left side, left SEM, right side. Then there are the posterior twisters that everybody forget. Splenius and semispinalis are primarily rotators. Posterior collis and lateral collis are secondary movement for splenius and semispinalis. They rotated ipsilaterally. So right splenius and semispinalis were rotated right side. And the left one rotated to the left side. 
how do you tell which ones are involved and which ones are compensatory? You say, oh, right, SCM was hypertrophied. Well, maybe it was trying to fight the splenus and semispinalis. How do you know? So the way you know is that look at the secondary action. SCM causes enterocolis and splenus and semispinalis causes postrocolis. So if you have a rotation to the right and an enterocolis, you know it has to be the left SCM, which causes rotation to the right and enterocolis. If it's a rotation to the right and a slight postrocolis, it has to be the right splenus semispinalis complex. And sometimes it's a combination of the two. As I said, combinations are far more common than the pure form. But just so you know which muscle groups are primary, so you can dose them right. If you keep injecting SEM, which was just trying to compensate the splenus and semispinous of that side, you will miss it. You will get worsening of the postrocolis. Very good. So here's a torticollis patient. Uh, you can also see a laterocollis. So if you look at this midline, you can see it's tilted. This would have been a straight line. There is also slight postural collis, hard to tell here. There is a right shoulder elevation. And if you look at the ears, the right ear is better visible than left in this picture at least. Again, remember splenius semispinalis, SCM, same muscles we have talked about. So here is the, I think I have shown you this technique for the splenius semispinalis, so we will skip it. And doses are similar to the other doses we talked about. Bigger muscles, 10 to 30 units. Smaller muscles, 5 to 20 units. And then you spread it out. Good. So Sarah, would you do injections on Sarah? Yes, it's the recommended treatment of choice by the AAN guideline. The chance of success is 80 to 90 percent. What would you tell about benefits of shots? 80 to 90 percent success. Very good. And what muscles would you inject and how much? Levator. So levator will be the first key muscle major player here. So we probably did 15 times 2, 30 units in levator, really, really high dose, maximum dose. It's a very thin, tiny muscles. And then we added trapezius. So here are other things extra that I had to skip. Trapezius also causes lateral and shoulder elevation. So we added trapezius, we added scalene that, you know, we didn't talk about. And then we also, SCM and splenius semispinalis also called lateral So remember the key muscle levator, but then all these extra muscles which will also cause lateral And then you have to decide which one to dose more based on is it the enterocolis or the postrocolis. Because she has enterocolis and right lateral collis, we went more for SCM and less for splenius and semispinalis. And scalene, anterior causes enterocolis, scalene posterior causes postrocolis. Again, in her case, it will be scalene anterior and medius that you will inject more rather than scalene as posterior. Very good. So black box warning, all toxins have black box warning of possible distant spread. You injected in the neck, patient came in with weakness in the legs. Yes, that's possible. It could be Botox. It can go into the blood, can spread. The chance is small, 1 in 10,000 uh, with Botox spreading, but the chance gets higher if you go up on the dose. We have patients that we go up to 800 units on for severe cervical dystonia and limb dystonia. So the risk is higher. Immune resistance, if you get benefit for a couple of times and now you're not getting any benefit, you have developed a resistance to the Botox. More frequent injections have higher risk of uh, um, immune resistance. So booster injections are not recommended anymore. Side effects, in the studies originally the dysphagia was 19%. That's why we have a modified approach to SCM. There's a risk of head drop, 12 to 20%. That's why I said avoid lunge SMS if you can. And then headaches and neck pain were also seen. Very good. So as I said, poor response, redecide. Main goal, ensure very successful treatment to your patient. Very safe, very successful, you have to do it right. And uh, remember, Botox is the only product we have here. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Kya naam hai aapka? Muhammad Arshad. Arshad. Danish. Nice to meet you. Unchi awaz mein ahista ahista das se piche ki taraf ginna hai. Very good. He has so many sensory tricks. Touching the neck makes it better, so he can stop his tremor many ways. So he's using all of them. Left SEM. So left SEM will cause a left lateral collis or a right lateral collis? It will cause a left lateral collis. But he has a right lateral collis. But he has a torti collis to the right. Right, there's a combination going on. So see how hard this job is. Yeah. So our right lateral collis is a true dystonia that we, we are bringing it out again and again. Okay. Right torti collis is true, right lateral collis is true. The entrocollis can be faked, especially if you're having a head tremor, then you would want to actually have it hold in right here. So if we focus on the right lateral collis with a right torti collis, then it has to be the right splenius and semispinalis complex. 
has to be that one because yeah. those are the primary movements. And we have to forget the intro and postural in this specific case okay. because that can fool you. They will say, okay, it's the left SEM. Now, left SEM needs to be injected. Here's another trick to remember. If you're having a tremor, tremor is a contraction of agonist and antagonist. Okay? So you have this direction, that direction. That's why to, to have the best success in tremor control, you have to inject a lighter dose in the antagonist muscles, even when they are trying to normalize it. But just to calm that tremor down, so if I'm doing the right splenus and semi-splenus complex to improve the dystonia towards the right, to improve the tremor towards the left, I will still inject the left SEM. So the answer was right, but you have to reach it to a process. So yes, a left SEM 10 unit makes sense because of the tremor, not from the dystonia. But now right splenus and semispinalis, we have to do anywhere from 10 or 15 units, one or twice, based on you know, the severity, EMG activity. In his case, probably I'll do 15 times two and 15 times one on spleen semispinalis, and I'll pick which one, two, which one, one, based on the EMG activity. Okay. okay. What else? I said right shoulder elevation. What that Levator clicks? Scapuli. Yeah, so electrocolis with a right shoulder elevation, levator scapulae. You have to inject the levator scapulae and trapezius muscle on him. Both of them causes that, but levator is the stronger one. So we have to inject that. Levator is typically 10 times 1 is a good starting dose or 15. Trapezius will be have to be spread out. It's a long muscle. So you do 5 times 3, you do 10 times 2. Depends. Each one have their own approach. Okay? So I will also inject the left splenius and semispinalis complex because of the tremor going on and also the right SEM. So much lower doses. So probably 10 times 1 and 5 times 1 on the left splenius semispinalis and maybe 5 times 1 on the right SEM or 10 times 1. Okay? And some of that is guided by the uh, EMG activity. Okay? So one of the biggest difference I have, biggest difference, and I think that makes a world of a difference is that we have a separate reconstitution needle. It's a deep while the injection needles that you have are not deep long in not long needles. So you, you have to invert or tilt the while to get it out. And I keep saying, don't invert it, don't invert it. But that doesn't work when you're injecting the patient. You have a short needle, you have to invert it. How else are you gonna get it out? So you need to get it out by a longer needle, a much longer needle. So you have a reconstitution needle you use only for reconstitution and then you draw it out. So I'm gonna use that and I'll do one cc dilution, uh, the UNMC approach. And that's why we need the lure lock because I'm going to use reconstitution needle, then I'm going to use the EMG needle to inject. And if I'm doing facial injections, then I'll switch to a facial needle. So I may use three or four different types of needle on the same patient. And I keep, you know, flipping back and forth with the lure lock. I draw a little over one cc. You are still going to have some loss of the fluid because of inefficiencies. That means the dilution will be a little less than 10 unit parts. It will be, might, might be 9.9 .9 units something but it's not worth you know worth it but for calculation purposes uh, I like to have a little extra there the bottle has to feel cold in your hand to tell you that the cold chain was never broken so remember Botox is the only product we have we're using 100 unit vial so there's a 200 unit vial we're not using that okay and then you have to be sure there was a vacuum in it the, as Dr. Nader said earlier that all of the Botox is right at the bottom so if you look at the vial you'll see a dirty white speck of a ring at the bottom of the vial, that's the toxin. There's no other toxin anywhere else. Other vials do it differently. Zeomin has it all over, so you have to actually invert it. But they have the different cap, so it doesn't get trapped. Okay? And you have to see the vacuum, so you'd never push it in, just like Nade said, and you just let it go in, and you have to see it being sucked in. Okay? And then, the, my approach, UNMC approach, is that we actually afterward break the vacuum, by just unscrewing the needle. You can hear the air suck in. You roll it, just like Nader did, okay? And then, we keeping it straight, now I can draw it out because I have a much longer needle to play with. And I can have a small window there to view it and just draw this drug out. So that's the dentic clavis, okay? It's a portable EMG unit, but it's just for sound only. You have no video on it. Sir, is it a Botox injection? Have you ever done it before? No, it's not. Botox will basically your muscles that are tight and will be tight. Okay? The effect of it starts for 4-5 days later. And then it starts to get more and more. The whole effect of it after a month later. The effect of it will be better for 2-3 months. Then it will start to get more and more. So, the effect of it will start to get more and more. So, the effect of it will repeat after 4-6 months. Absolutely right. So I try to start with, the, with what I think were the bad boys. So I know for sure with the EMG activity, I got it right. 
With the EMG, you can use much lower dose and still get the same result. So many patients with cervical dystonia, I don't have to go above 100 unit, but you know, with this much of muscle activity going on, so many direction, you may need 200 units uh, or 150, 160, uh, something like that. So splenius semispinalis complex. So it runs this way. So you have the trapezius and longissimus right in the middle. Remember the middle of the neck is not middle anymore. It has been moved away. And then you have the SCM going out down here. In between SCM and that groove is the splenius and semispinalis. You direct it where the ear is at, currently not where it should be, but currently where it is. So it's going towards that ear. First injection can be high right in the hairline. Second one can be lower. Just relax and relax. You can hear the tremor. So the first one is splenius and it's loud. So I'm going to give 15 units there. Okay. And now I'm going to go deeper in. And semispinalis is much more quieter. So we'll give five units there. Come back out and go one more. Splenius. You can hear the tremor. Splenius is the main in this tonic muscle here, we give another 15 units and we'll go deeper. And semispinalis is far more quieter. You can hear only a little bit. So another five units there. So five times two and 15 times two, that's what we thought were the major muscle. Let's look at the right levator now, which might be causing the lateral collis. It's a deeper muscle. First muscle was trapezius that you heard because it's right on top of the, of the levator. So I went through it and now I'm in deeper, quite a bit deep and that's the levator. Okay, and we'll give 15 units there. We'll, because trapezius was active, as we heard, swap button. So we'll do trapezius, and I'll do it lateral injections more than posterior one because that will cause a, a head drop. So we'll focus more on the lateral one that's pulling it down. So trapezius is simple, straightforward. It's the muscle you cannot miss. And sometimes you hear some activity, sometimes you don't. I will do five units times three on his trapezius. Now one tick to remember with trapezius is that if you do the shots too laterally, you will cause a shoulder droop. So you have to stay away from the shoulder a little bit. Very good. So these were I think the primary muscles. Now I'm going to go to the secondary muscles which I think are causing the tremor and do a little bit of drugs there. What 2cc value pakad lena syringe. But remember I am going by ticks. If I say I'm going to do 15 units, I'm going one and a half tick. I don't have to think. I don't have to ask anyone. I don't have to do any calculations. I know 10 units, one take, 15 units, one and a half take. One cc is that benefit for me on this patient. So let's check this left uh, sternocleidomastoid. Again, look at my approach. I'm going down up into the muscle belly and I'm going entering above the angle of the jaw to avoid and it may not be very active or you may hear the tremor in it. You can hear the tremor a little bit. So you know it needs it for the tremor. I'm going to give him 10 units there like we talked about. I'm going to look at the left splenius and semispinalis again for the tremor part to hear that tuck, 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 tremor in there, 2cc. Yeah, but this was 2cc dilution, right? This was 2cc dilution. Okay, now one take is 5 unit. Okay, I'll still go by ticks, but one take will be 5 unit now. I can hear it, but I don't know if you guys can hear it. He has a very tiny tremor there. So I'll give him a low dose there and check it one more time just to be sure. Relax. So not too bad. So I think the tiny dose will be enough. Five unit times two was the dose I used on these muscles. And we don't need to check the levator on this side. It has no electrocolis there. We can add the right SCM if we want to, or you can skip it if it's you know too many uh, injections because this should be enough. Uh, you injected both uh, both sides, so agonist and antagonist. And you can stop here, or if you want to be very perfectionist, you can go on and do a little bit on the right SCM because of the tremor that he's having side to side. And you can still hear the tremor. That means that you need to give this one too. So I'll use five units there. 
just for the tremor's sake. Okay. That's it. Questions? Concerns? Because the antagonist muscles, in addition to causing the tremor, or maybe the reason they're causing the tremor is because they're constantly fighting the agonist. So if the main agonist is dystonic, then has a strong pull. And to, to try to keep the head straight, his other muscles are unconsciously always fighting. If I weaken them, then I may lose the benefit. You know, I, I, got, I, I want them as on my side in that fight to keep the head straight. Exactly what I told that other gentleman to do, but I'll probably go pre-tassel a little bit more here again and then double the dose at the lateral canthus and then we will go medial and So, so again, really close to the eyelid, and one cc. So he has pretty severe blepharospasm. So I will give in more places for him, and give him a strong dose. And maybe later we can. So double dose at the lateral canthus. It's quite simple, the same five points. Stay away from the medial lower lid. But in his case, maybe a little bit into the corrugator, a little in the procerus. And I'll give in the orbital part also, lower down, a little further away. And what I can do sometimes is ask them to squeeze their eyes shut. So he's bleeding quite a bit. That's okay. This will settle down. Interest of time, we'll stop here. Basically, the same thing. What I did different in this gentleman was give more to the corrugator and the orbital part because he's got such severe uh, blepharospasm. He also has retrocollis. He may have a jaw opening. He has uh, dystonia, but I think abhi this is what bothers him the most. So we'll just uh, focus on the blepharospasm. We'll stop here and then we can conclude and then some. Uh, we'll be staying back to do more patients. It was really wonderful experience listening, listening to our distinguished speakers like Dr. Bhatti, Dr. Bajwa and Dr. Nazrali Sayyid, who no doubt delivered wonderful presentation about basics and hands-on training about port of its uses. I must say that we are getting more and more FDA-approved indications for port of now. For example, in 2016, we have indication FDA approved for spasticity in lower limbs. We have now indication for chronic migraine. And I would suggest to my newly emerging doctors in Pakistan that they should take keen interest in this technology because it would benefit their clients, their patients, as well as they must get acquaintance about this technology. Wherever, you get, wherever they get the chance, and uh, it is very important that we were very lucky to have Dr. Bhatti with us. I learned a lot myself. I don't have much, I mean, uh, idea about uses of Botox in my clinical practice because I missed this chance when I was young. But I must say, you are too lucky to have these people with us who are ready to teach you, who are ready to provide information for you. Thank you very much, all of you, my distinguished guests who gave us chance to learn from you. Thank you very much.